Hello. How are you? Very well. How are you? I'm good. I'm very, very excited for this. I don't think you really. <laughs> Me too. Okay, my third episode of Copper and Natter with the Queen of Oldham herself, um, <laughs> the biggest tea fanatic I know in my life. Um, Nicola White, thank you very much for joining me. Pleasure. Right, so I usually kick things off with bigging up my guests, and I'm, I take great pride in this. <laughs> I wait for it. So I've had the absolute pleasure of uh, playing on the same pitch as Nick White for our country for many years, and I've witnessed firsthand her wizardry on the hockey pitch. Um, from your childhood, it seems like you had a very sporty uh, upbringing, but hockey was kind of always your first love. You started playing at seven, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Since then, I think it's fair to say you have had a pretty illustrious career. Since <laughs> your day in June 2009, you've played for GB in England. This could be slightly wrong, but my figures say 186 times scoring 17 goals and winning a pretty impressive 14 international medals. You've obviously played in two Olympic Games, not just playing the two Olympic Games, but coming away with two medals, which I'm going to touch, pick your brains on um, a little bit later, as well as medals from World European Commonwealth Games, everything, everything that you can win a medal <laughs> in the world of hockey. So it's fair to say I'm joined by hockey royalty, I'm joined by tea drinking royalty, and I'm joined... <laughs> By the Queen of Oldham. So Nick White, thank you so much, Jill. Oh, it's so good to join you. Oh, Been waiting for my call up. Yeah, of course. I mean, I feel like although I have got some water, just you know, stay hydrated because it's absolutely roasting. I don't know whether you can see the screen, but I'm sweating right now. So I've yeah, I don't worry, me too. I apologise, but water's probably uh, sufficient enough. But anyway, so to kick things off. I've kind of already touched upon that you are the biggest tea drinker I know. And one of the main things that everyone wants to know about my cup and natter guests, look, she's even got the mug to look <laughs> apart. What my guests, like, uh, everyone wants to know about my cup and natter guests is how they like their tea. Okay. Mm -hmm. Considering you are pretty much renowned for your strong builder's brew, courtesy of Yorkshire tea, can you just give us a little inkling? How many cups of tea do you think you drink every day? Oh, do you know what? It's actually um, it's actually decreased a lot oh, okay. since the last couple of years because, um, well, just purely because I can't drink caffeine anymore. Like I'm on to decaf, but that's well, that's part of the problem. But um, before the injury, I was probably drinking. Oh, I mean, I've got teapots, but at least three, four. Yeah. five sometimes um but a good couple at least a day um and they have to be like super strong i don't know if you can see but like super strong yeah that that is most people are like no absolutely not but for me it has to be like a dash of milk and like really strong you have, uh, tea i mean to me you haven't put any milk in that whatsoever but yeah you do you and i think it's fair to say clarified that nick white knows a good cup of tea so <laughs> I'm not. I'm not going to waste my five quick fire tea related questions on that. I'm going to okay. give a little bit of a twist today to see. All right. How far, you know, you're obviously a good tea drinker, but do you know your stuff about tea? All right. Uh, this is okay. This is exciting. Okay. I hope so. No, you're gonna you're gonna smash it. Okay. Question number one. Are you more or less likely to get a caffeine crash? when drinking tea compared to coffee more or less likely uh well i don't really drink coffee so yeah i'd say yes tea that is the incorrect answer oh okay that's all right that's all right but, but there is more caffeine in tea apparently per thingy per whatever you would call it that's what i thought the answer was so that's why i went for tea you know sorry I'm sorry, Google's telling me otherwise, but that's <laughs> question number two. I'm sure you'll get this right. One to two minutes is the optimal time to let a tea brew. True or false? Oh, see, I disagree. I think it's three minutes, but 
Okay, as an average. Okay, you, you're giving me the eyes now. Do you say I'm right? I mean, optimally, it's supposed to be three minutes. So I'm going to say that's my answer. Guys, she's cheating. Correct answer, three to five minutes. Nick White knows her stuff. Okay. All right, so you've redeemed yourself. One question right. Okay, question number three. Which herbal tea is considered a superfood? A, green tea. B, lemon and ginger, or three, matcha? Matcha. Incorrect. <laughs> it's green tea, isn't it? <laughs> you know, really. It's green tea. Yeah, right. should have known that. Okay. I'm not sure whether you'll get this next one. Question four. What is the best-selling tea brand in the UK? Twinings, Earl Grey, or Yorkshire tea? I'm going to go... <laughs> Even though I absolutely hate it, I'm going to go Twinings. Correct. Yeah. Correct. It's absolutely disgusting. <laughs> I'm the best. Twinings. Cheers to that. No, it's definitely not. Anyway, I'm sure Maddie Hinch would um, agree that it's Yorkshire tea, but that's for another, yeah. another time. Okay, um, number five. As per the Guinness World Record book, what is the record for the most cups of tea made in one hour? Okay, to the nearest 100. All right, so is it A, 1,000, B, 1,400, or C, 1,800? Is this with the optimal three minute brewing time? <laughs> that is good. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um... I'm just going to, I'm just going to max out. I'm just going to go 1,800. Mate, 1,848 cups of tea were made by a team of 12 in one hour. How? I'd have loved to have been there. Well, you would have been chief tea drinker, that's why. I would have, I yeah. would. One and I hope it was Yorkshire. Well, well, yeah, maybe they'd give them that many cups of tea, but I mean, one cup of tea in one hour is sufficient for me. But yeah, that's the correct answer. I feel like you've done all right. And what is the best? And what is the best blend of Yorkshire tea? Yorkshire Gold. Yorkshire. I mean, I don't know. Yorkshire Gold. I don't drink it. But okay, fair enough. Well, that was fun. That was good fun. Yeah. Things Thanks for that. People. I mean, I, I say people want to know about your tea drinking and stuff, but really, they know more about you and your expertise on the hockey pitch. Okay. But considering this Cup and Natter series is an Olympic and Paralympic Games special, I'm going to mm -hmm. off every single guest asking them the same question, okay? And that's talking about, obviously, what should have been the summer, all right? Now, this question could be quite hard for yourself, considering that you played in two Olympic Games and, as I said, won two Olympic medals off of the back of that. But... If you had to pick one highlight or memory or performance, yeah, good luck with this, of an Olympic <laughs> Games or Paralympic Games that really stands out for you, what would it be and why? Good luck. Yeah. I mean, it's so, it's such a hard question because honestly, there are so many. Yeah. However, having thought about it, I'm just going to go with the one that inspired me the most on my journey oh. so it was dame kelly holmes winning double gold so you know the moment when she won crossed the finish line and she was like like yes. this I, I, she'd won the, yeah she'd won the 800 and then she won the 1500 and for me like that that moment just it was it's kind of the era of athletics um where you had, I mean, Jonathan Edwards um, was like a big inspiration, like Kelly Holmes, like Sally Gunnell, um, Colin Jackson on the hurdles, because I used to do hurdles when I did athletics. Um, like all that kind of era was quite a big inspiration for me. So, but like the Kelly Holmes moment was like, oh my God, like that is what, that's what I want. Like um, obviously double gold would be great, but just a gold medal would be fantastic. Um, so just the way that, you know, she expressed herself on that finish line of just like being gobsmacked yeah. um, and like the disbelief of like, I've done it and all the hard work and overcoming injuries and the story and everything about it was just like, wow. Um, 
and it just really hit me and, and the sort of image uh, is just never left so for me I think that always is just a moment that stays with me yeah I mean it's really interesting you saying that because I'm not gonna lie I wasn't expecting you to say that but that moment I think for me is my fir very first Olympic Games memory and I ah. think that I, I, I will honestly remember that moment we were actually on the family holiday at that point and I remember it so nearly. We uh, delayed our dinner, eating our dinner to watch Kelly Holmes. And wow, it's that, it's that, fi that finishing line image that you have in your head, which is just filled with such yeah. emotion and everything. Um, and I guess yeah. you know, your brains in that you say that obviously she won the two Olympic gold medals. Did you ever at that moment, obviously it was very insp inspirational for yourself, but did you ever in a million years dream that actually you would have the equivalent to Olympic medals, one being bronze, one being gold in, you know, in your lifetime? No. Um, at that point, I don't think I did. Like, I think I was still fairly young because I probably would have been the 12, what would I have been, 2004, Carmen. 16 um so yeah it was kind of sort of approaching um when things start to get more serious in in terms, in terms of hockey like you're moving through aren't you to the regional systems and you're hoping that then you're going to get that breakthrough into the england systems and things um but you i still i still think it's like a bit of a i mean at that point um there wasn't a centralized program um, you know, they were still working and then they would just try and qualify for the Olympics and go off and compete. So it was almost like it, it wasn't a thing for hockey to dream of what we have now. Um, yeah. So I think it was just like, I'd love to be Olympic gold medalist, but how on earth I'd make that happen? I have no idea. Like, I just was thinking I'd love to play for my country and then hope, you know, if I could get one somehow one day, then that would be a, an absolute dream. But I guess like growing up, it was just like this dream I had um, as a little girl thinking I just would like an Olympic gold medal. Like so that's all I've ever wanted. Um, like I think any athlete that's, or any sports person that's very sporty growing up, you just want to win. Like you just, you've just got that competitive drive to win. Um, you know, like, if anyone asks like my family or my brothers or they'll just be like she was an absolute nightmare because no matter if it was um snakes and ladders or <laughs> any like tiddlywinks or whatever it was like I would just boot the board game ruin it um there was just no happy playing memories because I would just ruin it because I just had to win like if I didn't win I would just go off and sulk so um it's just that sort of inner drive in me that I, I always want to be the best. I always want to win. And I know I come across sometimes as being not like that, but like deep down, I want that. And I want that whatever team I'm in, um, or if I'm running for myself, like when I used to do athletics, if I'm running for myself, I'd be really upset if I didn't win. I'd be like, right, <laughs> next time, what am I going to do to win? Because that is not happening again. So sometimes I don't come across like that, but deep down, I really am like that. I'm really driven to want to succeed so yeah I guess that's I, I didn't think at that point as a kid it would happen although I was just like on a path like everybody is on that pathway to think how what's my next step right I've got to get through the north of England right now I've got to get an England call up and then hopefully one day I get scouted and then but I didn't ever think it would be really a reality. It's crazy it's honestly crazy to hear but I suppose that desire to win and that winning instinct, that's, that's unique. Like, not everyone has it. And as you said, I mean, I think throughout your career, you've shown that you are a winner. And actually, you don't go to two Olympic Games and you don't win two Olympic medals by just settling. And I think I'd be slightly foolish to not ask you about, obviously, your two Olympic Games experience and how they contrast, obviously, one being a home Olympic Games, one being on the other side of the world on different time zones, one being your first experience, one being second. I know. Like bronze, like the contrast between the two. How do they, like, pin in your yeah. head? Like, hu hugely different. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, like, so when I think back to London, I, I, it was almost a bit of a whirlwind because, obviously, it was my first Olympic Games and I was, you know, overjoyed to be there. But the whole... The whole like London cycle was just um, 
it was a, it was almost like a ride that I was like swept along with because obviously you're young and it's the first time the program's like happen, happening and everyone's learning you know we're you're constantly adapting to try and make things better because you do something you're like ah that's not quite right we need to learn from that quick and make things better so you're constantly just like um as a youngster I was constantly looking up to like the senior players to be like ah right that's what I need to do because like because obviously they've been around longer so like their behavior was a lot more and obviously they've been they'd been at work and stuff I'd come from university yeah. you know living a bit of a rogue life come down to a program where all of a sudden you've got to grow up a lot faster and act a certain way and compete to a certain level and it's a lot faster and you're almost just a bit like whoa like this is uh this is a big j jump and you're aspiring to you know we, although we didn't say it because I think we were we just weren't in that place at the time to say we aspired to gold we all wanted it but it was just something we found difficult to say it was just a big jump so I felt like I was swept along a lot even though obviously applied yourself to the best of what you could so then when the actual olympics happened obviously i was i loved it and and i remember one of my favorite things was being stood in the tunnel like for the first game and i just had goosebumps like my <laughs> my hairs were on end and, and you could hear all the the home crowd just cheering and it was such like a special moment because we'd been through some grueling sessions on the pitch before as a squad, like really horrible sessions and really emotional sessions because, you know, although the people that get selected to go, there's a lot of people that don't. And with it being a home games, it's even more like on your doorstep and, and it's, it doesn't come around very often. So um I just remember it being like, well, this is like a really emotional time. Like I need to not cry right now. Like I'm about to go out for my first game. Um, and I also wanted to take it in because I didn't want to forget at that moment. I didn't want to, you know, let it pass and not take it in. So uh, obviously we ended up losing the semi-final, and that was a massive, you know, a massive down. And I've never seen the team in such like, you know we were in flood of tears and almost like a disarray of it was it was just painful um especially seeing a lot of the senior players that you would look up to just completely like you know inconsolable like I was I was they were and it took a lot um for us just to leave each other and have that moment to just almost grieve for what's gone um but we knew that we still had to fight for that that medal and then I think we'd come around to the fact of this is our gold like this is our this is our match and all right it's not a gold it's not a silver but we can still come away with something incredibly special and inspire so many people from this and match only one time obviously they did it in Barcelona match the same result which is still amazing so I don't know my London experience was amazing um very like fast pace and you're swept along and I love the home crowd having your family there because they don't get to come to lots of things sometimes um but because I was young and because I don't feel like my performances were as impactful or as good or um like I don't feel like I was the character that I am now and there's there's lots of things that I don't feel like I was then and it's purely because of age and experience and things like that it's just a very different thing, but I gave it everything and I loved it. Whereas Rio, I contrast it to being, I was ready, like I knew, I knew my role, I was fit, I was as fit as I've ever been. Like we were totally prepared and we'd spoken about gold. We were, we'd put it out on a plate to say, this is what we want. It was like a complete contrast for me of like where I was where the team was, what, what we'd learned from London. And, and yeah, I mean, obviously that journey was just like history making because we won all get all the games, which, I mean, you look back and you go, how did we do that? But all the prep that went into it was just insane. So uh, yeah, it's, it's such a proud moment to reflect on the Rio cycle. And for me, obviously, as much as I've got a lot of pride in what, what I personally achieved getting to London and the team. I have fonder memories of the Rio cycle because I think I was more ready and I was more impactful and I just, 
that that's just that's just where I'm coming from on that sense, I guess. But yeah, I think they're they're both so incredibly special to even achieve such a thing. Yeah. It's so interesting just here they are probably completely different experience, but in both of those experiences you've become a history maker. You've you've inspired a whole country to take notice of hockey and pick up a hockey stick and aspire to be like yourself. And it's interesting when you say even in the London Olympic Games themselves, there's still the highs and the lows that you experience. And you don't necessarily see that, do you, as kind of like the outsider. Um, but that's full. Mm -hmm. and I guess that kind of leads me on to my second question quite nicely in, you know, something else that you've had to overcome um, off of the back of an injury uh, you sustained in March 2017, a match that we were both playing in against Ireland for England at Bisham Abbey, uh, you sustained a concussion. Now, as a teammate and a friend, I've seen only some of some of the turmoil, the, the challenges uh, that you've been facing over the last few years, and maybe people on the outside probably wouldn't have seen so, actually, if you could, just give us a little insight of what's happened over the last couple of years and, and yeah, and how tough, actually, sport can be and with this concussion injury. Yeah, I think, I mean, <laughs> it's sport, isn't it? Um, I guess you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, we get, we get niggles, we get injuries all the time and... You know, I've had numerous niggles and injuries over my decade in, you know, the, in the program. But, you know, every single time you get something, you think, oh, it's fine. Like, it's a niggle, it's an injury. I'll be back in such a period of time. Um, and, and it's the first time that it's really, it's really hit me to, to be like, oh, what is this? Like... As far as I, the thing, the thing that's thrown me the most is as far as I was aware or most people I've known that have had a head injury or a concussion, um, they've come back, like whether it's been weeks, months, uh, not, not obviously the length of time I'm having out currently now, but it's almost like, it's that question of like, why? You constantly sat there going, why? Like, what is going on? And it's so frustrating and so confusing because you just, uh, when you when it happens, you're like, right, okay. So, okay, I'll be back in a few weeks because obviously it's, you know, just a few headaches and a bit of sickness, nausea and um, whatever problems and light sensitivity, noise sensitivity, and, and that'll go in a few weeks. So, yeah, I'll be back, you know, in a month. And then you, you're like, oh, right, no, that's not, not it. And you, so you're sitting there going, all right, well, I'm sure it'll be like another few weeks because obviously that's, that's what I've, I've normally heard from most people. And then it carries on and you just sort of sit in there thinking, well, I don't really understand. And then that's what threw me the most is because I had a, like a, I guess that that's just what I thought was going to happen. Um, and I guess that's just my naivety of the situation, not understanding enough about it. Um, and where probably most people, what most people think, um, which is why I've tried to sort of raise some awareness through the injury to allow people to understand a bit more, because I think it's really um, misunderstood. Um, and having been in a few groups uh, with lots of people that have been injured through sport or through just general being out and about and at work, like it's misdiagnosed and people are going undiagnosed and and it's really sad because it's it's a really lonely place when you get a head injury and and it affects like it affects your function like it's all right it's not too bad like if you broke your leg sprained yeah. your ankle or hurt because it's it's in my in, from my experience of having leg injuries or knee injuries or hip injuries whatever it is back injuries it's a it's like a physical injury where you're like ah oh, well yeah I can't I can't squat or I can't bend down or I can't do that but I can see I can hear I can think I can talk you know all your sort of senses and communication channels are just open and normal whereas with this it completely throws you because you're just um, you just become someone that you're not and you don't understand and you don't 
nothing's clear and and it's just really frustrating because it takes a long time for you to oh it has for me personally because of how how far it did impact me like how how severe the symptoms were um it just took a long time for me to accept that that was it and your identity then as a hockey player was gone um like that wasn't what you could do any longer so it's like well what am i now yeah. um you just you're not you're not anybody you're not anything um i can't function properly i can't socialize um I, yeah you just sort of you always it's a very negative spiral and that's where you've got to then think of the positives um and find something to latch on to and that's where it's it's really sort of um what's the word <laughs> i can't think of the word it's almost like patronizing because it's it's like oh brilliant like i've i've just done a five minute walk around the block and you're sort of saying to myself like this really patronizing but if you don't say it then you'll have nothing positive for the day because that might be the only thing you've done for the day and you have to say that's really good because you might not have done that two weeks ago but it's really good that you've gone to see someone for a coffee and then can't come home that's like a really good step um so like over time you just i've really had to learn to speak to myself in a different way um i still have slips and stuff and i still struggle and i still it's still not perfect but it's a lot better and because i'm better and i'm getting better it gets easier yeah. uh, the more you improve the easier it is but because i've just been left with um chronic vestibular migraine which we don't know uh when the end is it might just be something i've got to manage they they think it will be a recovery but they don't know when you just sort of you almost have to just change you have to change your lifestyle you have to just change around it and that's what i'm learning to do now so hopefully it shouldn't stop me doing things in the future because there's no reason it should um you just manage it with like anyone else would with a chronic disease like you just manage it with medication and stuff but that's just what it is and hopefully people from it can understand and help other people moving forwards that it just a small gesture or a small reaching out can make a massive difference to someone's life that's really going through a traumatic injury like that because i'm just really grateful to the people that have obviously helped me through it yeah i think it really highlights doesn't it that sport is not all you know sunshine and daisies is you know with the highs come the really really lows and I mean, I, I've said this to you a number of times. I'm in awe of the positivity that you've shown throughout what must have been a really, really tough, tough few years for yourself. But it just shows the strength of character that you have, that you have come out, you know, the other side and you've remained really focused, really motivated and not lost sight of the progress that you've been making, which is honestly inspiring in itself. Not to obviously mention the fantastic work that you're doing in helping others, raising the awareness of concussion and stuff like that, which is honestly amazing. But I, I've said this, I'm in awe of, of what, you've, what you've overcome, continuing to battle, and I'm sure everyone else will be exactly the same. Um, and I guess, again, that kind of leads me on nicely. You're inspiring so many people through your tough times. But also, you know, through, throughout everything that you've overcome, everything that you've achieved in your international hockey career, I think there's one place in the country where you have had the biggest impact on. Okay? <laughs> and that is kind of old. Okay, so for everyone that's unaware, Nick White is the biggest Oldham, you know, props to Oldham, representing all the time. Queen of Oldham, she goes by the name of. Um, in 2016, the after Rio, Oldham's first Olympic gold medalist since uh, more than a century ago. That's outrageous. Also, yeah. after Rio, you became the sixth female recipient to receive Freedom of the Borough. Again, pretty impressive for you know someone from a small town up north. Um, so I just I, I want to know. Like, what do you think has been the biggest impact that you and all of your achievements have had on all? What, what impact they've had? Yeah, what, 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 what would you say has been the biggest impact that you've had on everyone? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I mean, obviously, like, for me, it's just been um, 
I mean, obviously, as part of the program, you'll know, like, we, one of our things is about giving back. Um, and with being based down here, and all of us um, are based down here, a lot of the appearances we used to do anyway, um, we would obviously just normally come and do it around here because it's easy. Uh, a lot of our time is here. And I just used to keep thinking, but I just I need to go back home to do some. Like, it's not fair that... You know, I grew up in Oldham, um, a lot of people and volunteers and, you know, a lot of, you know, my journey was based around Oldham and Manchester, Greater Manchester. And, um, you know, they, Greater Manchester asked me to be a Greater Sport Ambassador. Um, and I was a bit like, I really should make the effort to go home and inspire people up there because as much as people may, may disagree, they may or may not disagree, but um, for me, like, being a northerner and coming down south um and having tried to break into the system from the north um there, there's quite for me there's quite a big difference between hockey in the north and hockey in the south in terms of um provisions and pitches and um you know schools uh, yeah school pitches um maybe amount of clubs um just things that are going on like there's a lot more going on down here um so yeah it's just really important for me to go back so one of the things i did was after london 2012 and after rio um i put on like a school road show and i thought right i'm gonna dedicate a block of time and just book up a load of schools and that's why um the free woman came about as well well mainly came about because i've done so many um and we just booked in like over, i mean i've done over in total probably nearly 200 school appearances um a mix of like assemblies um a few mini coaching sessions q and a's and just going around to like mainly primary schools a few secondary schools um and just engaging with the kids just to say look like um, it wasn't anything hardcore. It was just basic, basically saying, look, this is my journey. I'm from here. Like, I'm just a young girl. I was like you, sat on the floor of an assembly, and I watched the TV and saw these amazing Olympians. It was gymnasts when I was little. And I just thought, I want to be an Olympian, like a sports person. That's what I want to be. And it's more just to say to them, like, just have a dream, like, aspire to do something like you might not be now but when you get to year six or year seven or into june uh into senior school like have something to aspire to do because um for me if you don't have a purpose if you don't have something to to aspire to then you, you're not you're not working towards anything you're not learning you're not pushing yourself you're just sort of meandering through life and then you're not going to go to like maybe extra cur curricular clubs uh you're just going to maybe just go on the streets and yeah. not going to say go and do bad things but you're just not going to be engaged with things so it's more just to tell them to think about things and have something to aspire to and tell them that my story isn't all perfect I've made it but it was definitely not perfect like I failed at the first hurdle I didn't get into the England I failed at my first England trial and thought it was it so yeah for me it's just about inspiring people to be active have a dream it's not all roses like it's going to be hard but just don't give up because if i'd have given up there's definitely no way i'd be here with medals i'd have i'd have given up when i was 15 at my first trial so um and i'm so grateful that the people of Oldham have enjoyed it and they absolutely love looking at the medals so yeah I, i'll i will continue and i would love to have a legacy um, around Greater Manchester and that's what I'm going to work on so that I feel like I've left something for all of those um, children and that they've you know they've got some I feel like I've given back to them. I think it's fair to say I mean I can't say I've ever been to Oldham I'd love to go but I'm sure you have had an incredible impact on everyone in that town I mean your successes speak for themselves but your desire to give back you say and leave that legacy speaks volumes for the kind of person that you are and they're lucky to have a gem like you uh, i read that paul skulls is also from oldham uh, <laughs> yeah. but nicola white for me is the pinnacle <laughs> so keep doing what you're doing it's honestly phenomenal it's really really inspirational but um i feel like 
I know that we're slightly running over this 30 minutes, but I have got a few social media questions. All right, then. Is that all right? Fire on. Go okay. on. I haven't actually got any Oldham-related uh, questions, which I'm slightly disappointed on. But I have got <laughs> one from Tracy on Instagram, which made me laugh quite a lot, okay? She wants to know, can you explain your nickname, Delphi? <laughs> Delphi. <laughs> How does she know this? Oh, oh God. God. Um, I, right. I, it was mentioned on the um, BBC uh, Greatest Olympic Moments. Um, oh, God. Yeah, it was. Yeah, you can blame them for that. Um, right. So, obviously, <laughs> Delfino Marino um, is a great goal scorer for Argentina. And uh, basically, I play midfield and goal scoring has always been one of my challenges. And it's always been something that I've worked hard on. So pre-Rio, um, the year leading up to Rio, or two years leading up to Rio, I was like, right, I'm going to focus on my goal scoring because I want to score more goals. And it's, it's really important that I build this into my game because my midfield game is a good strength, but I need to add on the end bit now. And um, I was like, Right, got Marino. She' gonna watch her and Velton. Velton's also good, but her name's not catchy. <laughs> um, and uh, so, yeah. So in one of the games, like <laughs> Del Delphi, like undercut the ball into the roof of the net, and I was like, I can so do that. <laughs> like, anyway, I started scoring. I, was, I think I just started scoring loads of goals, or I think in training, like. I started scoring some goals or and the, so people just started calling me like Delphi because I think I just kept going on about it so much that I was saying I'm just gonna score like Delphi like I'm just gonna be Delphi every time I get in a circle what would Delphi do she'd obviously hit the ball so hard or undercut it so I then started to just mimic what I thought she would do and then sometimes it was great because it got you into a mindset of a goal scorer, like get you out of what you would do and put you in the shoes of a goal scorer. So as soon as you cross that line, it's like Delphi. And then you just, you know, you know get what? it at a goal or do something. It, it's a bit of a joke, but I would say I could easily right now adopt what would Nicola White do because you don't score in an Olympic final without having nope. kind of skill. I know. And it's a really good, like, I mean, now, I don't think now I think about it as much, but at the time, it was really effective. And it just brought, like, a more of a, a fun, aggressive side to me where it was relaxed, it, but it just brought that little bit of a, an edge to me because, I, you know, I love the Argentinian team and I love Argentina and, and it's, it's one of my, it's my favourite team, really. So... It just brought a bit of like a fun dynamic for me. And as a player, I, I think she's great. So, and that's where it came. It just sort of stuck then. Everyone thought it was hilarious that I just thought, that's it. I'm just going to mimic her. Well, maybe, I just... maybe it's going to catch on now. Nicola White has a pretty impressive track record. A double Olympic <laughs> medalist. Let's get this going. What would Nicola White do? Don't worry about this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do some more Andy Murray shots. Did, did you know they were in the tennis? They were in the tennis. They were in the physio room when I scored the goal, and they said they were like, and Andy Murray was getting treatment, and they were like, Andy, did you see the shot that the girl did? Oh and he God. was like, Yeah, not bad. They actually commented on my overhand shot. Oh. I was like, Who? Why did no one tell me about this? Andy Murray could take a lot of a uh, lot of tricks. I know. Your hockey game on the hot tennis court. I know. Maybe he's saying that himself. What would Nicola White do on a tennis shot? I know. I'd like to see Andy Murray. I'd like to see a, a, a sport switch. I've done the Andy Murray shots. So I need to bring like a hockey into the tennis arena somehow. Let's get that challenge right there. Couple and match exclusive. <laughs> Nicola White challenge Andy Murray to reciprocate the uh, sport. Yeah. Shot. It could go viral. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm very wary. I said it was 30 minutes. We've gone well over, of course, as I would expect. Um, my cup of tea is empty. Yours probably has brewed perfectly right now because she loves to live. It is. Um, <sighs> but honestly, thank you so, so much for joining me, Nick. It means the world. Obviously, um, I am very excited for the news that uh, you announced last week that you are 
coming back on the pitch next season for Hampstead and Westminster. So I wish you luck with that, kind of, until we until Surbiton play Hampstead and Westminster. But, um, yeah, as I said, I look forward to seeing your wizardry back on the hockey pitch where you belong, Gail. But, um, yeah, thank, thank you, you. Thanks for joining me. It means a lot. Thanks, Em. Not at all. I loved it. My, my next guest will be revealed on Thursday at 6pm, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, but in the meantime, everyone, thank you very much. Keep that kettle boiled. Keep Natter and using the hashtag Cover and Natter. And I'll see you again, same time, same place, next Monday. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you. Bye. Take care.